Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sue. I'm from the Gut Cancer Foundation. And it's uh, my pleasure this afternoon uh, to welcome our guest speaker, uh, guest speaker Dr. Rachel Purcell. Uh, but before I do that, um, just a little bit of housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded um, and we will share the recording with you um, via email after the, after the event. So if you have to duck out um, from the webinar, uh, don't worry, we will be sending the recording through. So the format we're going to follow today, I'm just going to briefly introduce the Gut Cancer Foundation and give a little bit of um, context around gut cancers and uh, why we're holding this webinar today. Um, I'll then introduce our um, guest speaker, Dr. Rachel Purcell, and Rachel and I are going to have a fairly informal discussion with a Q&A type format around the topic of the microbiome and, and cancer. Now you will see that you've got a Q&A uh, facility, um, the, um, might be on the bottom of your screen, you've got a Q&A box, so do as we go through, um, jot down any questions you have and I will end, end up endeavour to uh, ask those questions at the relevant times. Um, but if I miss one, I will go back at the end um, and we'll attempt to answer all your questions at the end of the webinar. So um, without further ado, just a little bit of background on the Gut Cancer Foundation, if you're new to us. Um, our mission is that we uh, fund predominantly innovative uh, research and clinical trials into cancers of the digestive system, the gut cancers, which make up starting from the top, the esophagus, stomach, liver, pancreas, uh, gallbladder, bile duct, and uh, finishing off with um, the colon, rectum, and anus. Um, so our mission is twofold, both funding the research, uh, but also providing uh, information and education to hopefully um, improve the lives of, of New Zealanders with these cancers. So just a little bit about gut cancers in New Zealand. Collectively, they're the most common cancer, uh, making up 22% of all cancer diagnoses, with over 5,700 New Zealanders diagnosed every year, um, and that equates to 15 every day. So broken down into uh, the lower and the upper um, gastrointestinal is another um, term for these cancers. The lower GI cancers, which make up colorectal cancer and anal cancer, make up for uh, just over half of all those diagnoses. But as you can see, uh, the upper GI cancers, 2,500, over 2,500 diagnoses every year. Um, unfortunately, with this group of cancers, the survival rates uh, generally are, are very poor. Um, you'll see the table on the left is from the Cancer Control Agency report that came out earlier this year, showing that of the six cancers that have uh, less than 30% survival rate, um, four of those are in fact uh, gut cancers. And if you look at the table on the right, uh, pancreatic cancer and esophageal cancer have the lowest survival rates of any cancers. And um, unfortunately, these are on the increase in New Zealand. So this is a favorite quote of ours, you know, no country can afford to treat their way out of the cancer crisis. Um, I think that's pretty relevant to what we're gonna be discussing today in looking at uh, one of our um, focus, focuses of our mission is prevention. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Rachel Purcell, just stop sharing the screen and introduce Rachel uh, to the discussion. Um, Rachel is a senior research fellow at the University of Otago in um, Canterbury, based in Canterbury. And um, it's our pleasure to have her here today. Uh, she specializes in the microbiome uh, in her research field. And I think to kick it off, Rachel, we'll just start with a very broad question that uh, might, uh, yeah, we could talk about all day, but uh, just if you briefly just introduce the microbiome, what it is, what its function is, and, and in particular to the gut, um, you know, what, what impact does it have on us day to day? Thanks very much, Sue. Um, kia ora koutou, everybody. Um, 
Yeah, so I'm a microbiome researcher, so I'm very excited to get to talk about the microbiome because it's my favorite subject. Um, so we probably heard quite a bit about it maybe in the media a lot recently. The, the term kind of gets bandied about quite a bit these days, but um, a lot of us maybe don't have that explanation of what it means. So in the simplest terms, the microbiome is a community of microorganisms um, so fungi, bacteria, viruses, um, et cetera, that exist in a particular environment. So in, hum in humans, the term is often used to describe um, microorganisms that live in or on a particular part of the body, such as the skin or the gastrointestinal tract. Um, so microbiomes have what we would call um, symbiotic relationship with their environment. So that means they they both benefit, the host benefits and the microbes benefit from that relationship of living together. Um, and the microbes have often evolved alongside the host, um, whether the host is you know, a plant or an animal, and they've adapted to survive in that particular environment. So you find a very different um, composition in the microbiome, for example, of like seaweed, as you'd find compared to something you'd find in the human gut. Um, and then depending on the particular environment, um, it'll have different functions. So as you can imagine, like soil microbiome would have a very different function to the microbiomes found in like the human body. Great. And so in particular, um, you know, if we're looking at, at the gut microbiome, um, you know, what, what sort of outside uh, influences, I suppose, influence our, our gut microbiome and, and how does that sort of impact our overall health and well-being? Okay, so, well, this is, this is a huge one. Um, <laughs> I know it's quite a broad question and we could probably okay, talk Okay, don't, don't let me ramble on for too long. <laughs> but we didn't really know much about the microbiome, the human microbiome, until about 15 years ago, because we just didn't have the technology. So we used to isolate, you know, a couple of bacteria here and there, but then suddenly we had this amazing sequencing technology and we realized then that there were, you know, literally thousands of different species living in our gut. So each one of us would ha has trillions of bacteria in our gut, for example. And then we start to realize the really important functions that the microbiome plays in just human health. So some of the, like the broad areas are um, in metabolism and in um, immune protection, basically. Um, so in terms of like metabolism, like, like I can give you a few examples of things the micro gut microbiome does is it's involved with um, involved in vitamin synthesis. So it actually makes vitamin D and vitamin K. Um, it's involved in amino acid synthesis, so making amino acids that are the building blocks for proteins. Um, and also, also, one of my favorite examples is, um, I don't know if when you were young and if you studied biology, we used to be taught about the different food groups, and we were taught about fibers and that the, um, the only really function of fiber was um, to help everything move through our bowels, that you know, there was no, no nutrient value in it. But what we know now is that um, humans can't actually digest fiber and get nutrients from it because we don't actually have the enzymes, but the bacteria in our gut do. So they actually break down these, nutri these fibers and into nutrients that we can use um, as a food source, as an energy source, and also as an anti-inflammatory um, kind of molecule in our gut. So really important functions there. Oh no, that's fascinating. And um, so, uh, you know, I often hear talked about, um, you know, and I think in our previous webinar that we had with uh, Professor Claire Wall on nutrition, we, we sort of touched briefly on sort of good and bad bacteria in your gut or, or good and bad microbiome as, a, as another terminology. Um, yeah. You know, how, uh, how and, and, and Claire did touch on this in the earlier webinar, the, the impact of what you eat on, on your you've mentioned fiber already um you know could you sort of expand on that a little bit yeah yeah so i mean the gut microbiome is influenced by loads and loads of external factors things in our environment and our lifestyle um, and one of the biggest factors that influences it and changes it on a, on a daily basis is what we eat um so if you, you kind of like, to, I like to think about the microbiome as being like an army inside of us. So if you feed the army particular food, you give it particular food, it will um, allow particular bacteria to survive. But if you change it, it will allow different ones who use that, those particular nutrients to 
kind of thrive in that environment. So really what we feed our microbiome is really important in terms of um, kind of what it does in, in its function. So like I talked about fiber, um, plant-based fibers particularly are very important because they're broken down then into these molecules that are, have an anti-inflammatory effect, a very protective effect, and protects our gut lining, which is really important to prevent um, kind of diseases down the track. Um, mm. Yeah, we know, we know a bit about, um, you know, eating too much meat um, can have a bit of a detrimental effect on the microbiome and maybe shift it to something that's kind of like less healthy. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like these, uh, a nuanced kind of, approach to you know how you can change your microbiome and even little changes in your diet can actually have, have a, a, an overall effect on the microbiome and kind of shift it in, in one way or the other. Hmm. And, and just expanding on that a little bit, um, you know, are there things, uh, you know, if we're talking short or long term um, changes to microbiome, are there things that we can do in the short term uh, to improve the composition versus long term? Yeah, and a lot of these are things that um, Claire has touched on in terms of diet. Um, you know, it's the increasing our plant-based fibers, uh, decreasing our meat, even just a little bit, um, limiting the alcohol intake, because we know our microbiome really doesn't like um, too much alcohol. Um, yeah, and, and processed foods as well. And um, so really, you know, there have been some quite nice studies done on changing people's diets so that they eat um, a mainly processed diet and has a very detrimental effect on the microbiome. Mm. But the microbiome is also very resilient, so it can bounce back from that. So, you know, having a day or, you know, here and there where you're, you know, not on track, it's not the end of the world either. No, no. Well, that's great. And, and just for anyone watching at the moment um, that might have missed the earlier webinar that we did with Claire Wall, a professor, professor of nutrition, that is available on our website to view and also our YouTube channel. Um, so I'd highly recommend um, going watching that for, for more information on the whole topic of nutrition and uh, cancer. Uh, but looking at the microbiome in particular and, and now linking it to gut cancers, you know, what evidence is there out there at the moment around sort of the connection between your microbiome and cancer? Yeah, there's um, actually very strong evidence that adverse changes in the gut microbiome are linked to um, gastrointestinal cancers. So there have been multiple studies looking at the gut microbiome you know, from large numbers of cancer patients um, and comparing that then to healthy volunteers. And that's usually looking at um, you know, what you get in a poo sample. So it's actually mm. quite easy to do. It's not really invasive. Um, and what we see from that is, um, particularly with colorectal cancer, there's a really strong link between changes in the microbiome, the gut microbiome and um, having a colorectal cancer. But I mean, there's some quite, I guess, caveats, you know, to do with working with microbiome samples and particularly the gut microbiome. Um, and a lot of it that's to do with, we don't really know at this stage whether it's causative or whether the changes we see are an effect of actually having the tumor. And it's probably a little bit of both. And at the uh, moment, yeah, we don't, because we, it's such a new science, really, we're kind of talking 10, 15 years, we don't have those longitudinal studies um, following people, you know, regularly to see how changes in their, their microbiome actually associate with developing cancers, particularly gut cancers, because we know they develop over a long time. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And also Claire made reference to, I suppose, the challenges of doing longitudinal studies um, in this field and, you know, the the variety everybody has a different microbiome so um yeah Excellent. you know do you want to expand on some of the challenges yeah. facing this sort of research yeah i mean those longitudinal studies are difficult to set up um some countries that already have the kind of infrastructure infrastructure to, to do those studies are already um they have them set up so it's not that difficult to you know start taking different types of samples and doing that analysis. But it's quite expensive if you, want, if you want to look at the numbers of people that you need to actually, you know, get really meaningful results. Um, because there are a lot of very small scale studies out there, but, you know, some of the, them are conflicting as well. So you really need the numbers. Um, yeah. But also, yeah, you're, very, you're correct in terms of we are all unique when it comes to our gut microbiome. It's kind of like a fingerprint almost. So mm. you know, there are maybe 
thousands of, of particular species that you could have in your microbiome, but you might only have maybe two, three hundred, maybe up to a thousand each. So that means, you know, while there is some overlap, um, we're all different. And that means we don't have this kind of baseline normal gut microbiome to kind of contrast everything to and say, oh, well, that's definitely different. So mm. all those, those variables, it does make it quite tricky to, to uh, study. So how, how do you approach it? Do you look at trends in, in certain types of um, bacteria that yeah. are showing up? And Yeah, well, there's kind of two things that we look at. We look at um, diversity. That's a really important marker of um, microbiome health. So the more species you have, generally the healthier the uh, microbiome is. It's gonna, nature likes diversity. It's like if you imagine a forest, you know, a nature forest with hundreds of different types of plants and you know bird song everywhere and fungi growing up in the ground and you compare that to say a pine forest that's just got the one species in it and it's silent and feels almost kind of dead you know so we, we think of it in those terms the more species you have in any particular environment the healthier it tends to be and we can easily measure that and then we can look at um, specific bacteria and if we know what the functions of those bacteria are, then we can kind of get a better sense of what the microbiome is doing. And if it's affected badly, that it's actually not carrying out those functions. So we can mm. look at more of a functional approach. Right. Oh, no, that's really interesting. Now, just seeing we've got a couple of questions come in as we've been talking. I'll just um, have a look here. We've got a few questions here. Wondering about the effect of sugar and whether it con contributes to gut cancers. Well, I think um, rather than going into that in this webinar, I'd encourage um, Elizabeth, who's posed the question, to watch our previous webinar from Dr. Claire Wall, who talks a lot about nutrition and diet and links to cancer. Um, the subsequent question around, is taking probiotics helpful? Oh, right. That's, that's another really um, favorite topic of mine, actually, at the moment. Um, I can honestly say anything that you can buy over the counter at the moment is not going to have any particular beneficial effect. Um, and that might be disappointing for people to hear. And I think we're kind of sold a lot of these ideas that, you know, oh, maybe it's a guilt can guilt you into kind of doing something for your microbiome, but there's, there's no really strong evidence from um, well-designed studies that any of those over-the-counter probiotics are um, actually beneficial at the moment. And there actually is some um, evidence from studies that, um, for example, if you take, you're taking antibiotics and you, you, that really clears out your, your gut microbiome. And then if you take probiotics, um, what you can end up, what can end up happening is that that one or two species that's in those probiotics actually really flourishes and then doesn't allow space for your, your own microbiome to, to regenerate. So there may actually be um, a detrimental effect. Um, there have been a couple of studies looking at that. Um, there's also been a study recently that came out from um, a big group in the States who were looking at cancer patients um, being treated with immunotherapy. And they saw that patients who were taking over-the-counter probiotics actually did worse. So that was quite an interesting paper. Um, yeah, so I, I definitely be. Um, I do think there's a future in probiotics, but I think the kind of commercial side of it has jumped the gun a bit. Um, and has, you know, there's, they just don't have those studies and the evidence to kind of back up what's being sold at the moment. So I'd say watch the space and. It, there's a lot of research being um, going into developing, you know, something that actually does work and that we understand why it works, but we're not quite there yet. So I hope that answers that yeah, question. Yeah, I guess, <laughs> yeah, no, that's fascinating. Um, and I guess for someone that's taken antibiotics and, and being cleaned out, what would your recommendation be then, you know, just to eat lots of fiber and, yeah, and try and boost? Yeah, dollars on, you know, a range of, fresh fruit and veggies instead and whole grains you know right the food you'd get for that same amount of, you know for what you'd pay for probiotics um yeah i think that, that's money better spent on fruit and veggies <laughs> great and uh also wondering whether intermittent fasting or fasting mimicking diets are helpful um 
I don't know if you can comment yeah, on that, Rachel. That might be something Claire could comment on more. I yeah. think I think did Claire did cover that off in her her webinar. So again, um, you know, to the person that's asked the question there, just just check out the previous webinar and, and you might find some of those answers. By all means, drop us an email um, if you need to find out more, and we can try and get the answers uh, to those questions. Um, so just moving on now, Rachel, um, sort of to the next, I suppose, um, sort of area of the talk today and looking at, at the microbiome and, you know, potential research that's going on around diagnostics and treatment. And I know, for instance, maybe if we can look at the treatment first, I mean, um, thanks to um, all our supporters out there, we were able to fund a piece of your research, Rachel, um, a couple of years back on uh, looking at the role of the microbiome um, and with colorectal cancer. I mean, would you like to talk, yeah. talk a little bit about that research and where it's moved on to since, since that funding was made to you? Yeah, now we were very grateful to get that initial seeding funding from the Gut Cancer Foundation, because it's actually often difficult to get those, that initial funding to, to start a project. Um, and that was fantastic. So we started looking at um, the tumor microbiome and colorectal cancer. So I work mainly with colorectal surgeons. Um, so that's, you know, my, my area of interest is kind of supporting those, um, those clinicians and I do the, the laboratory side of it. Um, so we were really interested um, in looking to see if different subtypes of colorectal cancer had a different microbiome. Because what we were looking at from all of the, the published studies at the time was that everybody was treating colorectal cancer as if it was just like a single entity. And we know from, you know, how different people respond differently to, to treatment and people have a different prognosis. And we know on the molecular level that there's kind of different subtypes. We thought, well, if we actually subtype the, the tumors, maybe we'll see different patterns in the microbiome. So we carried out this um, a, a pilot project with a, a small number of um, colorectal cancer patients. We looked at their tumors and we subtyped them um, based on kind of what's happening at the molecular level in the cells and in the immune cells around the, the tumor cells. And then we looked at the microbiome signatures um, based on the, the subtypes. And we found that they were really different between the subtypes. And what was really interesting to us was that one particular subtype that has this um, really strong immune cell activation had um, a signature of um, bacteria that were um, already had been associated with colorectal cancer. And a lot of them were um, pathogens that you find in um, the mouth. So they're oral pathogens. So we thought that was really interesting. So we, we went on, we did a, a bigger study on that then. And um, we also, so we went to, yeah. So what we really wanted to do is just kind of identify whether um, those bacteria in that particular subtype were actually changing the immune, the micro environment in, within that tumor. And to see if we could then learn from that and bring some of these studies back into the laboratory and test this out in um, cell lines and then see if we could change the immune kind of activation um, of, a, of a tumor and make it more responsive to therapy potentially. So that's kind of where we brought that. We brought it into the lab and we developed some um, experiments to, to try and test what happens if we put particular bacteria into um, colorectal cell lines. And we had some really, really interesting results that we were able to change um, what happens on the molecular level and what happens to the immune cells. And now we're, we're, we're starting to do some work in animal models. Mm. That's, that's really exciting. Yeah. I mean, I, and I guess it's got the potential to improve treatments or make more tailored yeah. treatments for patients and improve outcome for patients in the long run. Well, really where we're kind of heading with this is, um, I don't know if everybody's heard of immunotherapy because it's not something that's really used so much in GI cancers, but um, immunotherapy has really kind of changed the face of cancer therapies for certain types of cancer, but it's, it doesn't work well in colorectal cancer. Like for the vast majority of colorectal cancer, it doesn't have any effect. So we're seeing in this small um, subtype of colorectal cancer, um, kind of a signature that, that tells us that immunotherapy will work well in these this small number of patients, but what we want to do is to try and use the microbiome within the tumor um, and see if we can develop something that will change that, that environment of the tumors 
for you know the other you know 80 to 90 percent of colorectal cancers and potentially make them more um you know able to have a response to immunotherapy so it's very very much in the kind of the early stages but you know that's kind of that's our, our goal and that's our, our vision for that that's really exciting and and the potential of it could be yeah, huge could um, be given huge. that um you know as we, we saw earlier through my slides, you know, bowel cancer or colorectal cancer makes up about half of all the um, gut cancers diagnosed in this country. So that could be a huge impact. Um, yeah, I think so. And yeah, we do, we do, don't do well in New Zealand. We have very high rates of it here and it's, yeah. it's on the increase in younger people as well. So yeah, yeah. It's really something we need to tackle. Yeah. So, so what's the next stage for you with this, this sort of line of research? And um, with that line, we're, we're, doing some work in an animal model with some um, collaborators in Dunedin. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's kind of where that's yeah. going at the moment. And yes, it seems so far so good, but, you know, I mean, also working in an animal model isn't working in humans, so. Yeah. Fingers yeah, so it's, you want to be. It's, it's still a, a way off <laughs> yet, but. <laughs> realistic, yeah. Yeah, and it does, it takes a lot of time. Mm. Yeah, And we see that, in, you know, some of the other studies that have been done looking at the microbiome and you know, other types of cancer. Um, yeah. that, that research is really kind of um, progressing very well in other centers. Yeah, okay. All right, I've got another question there. Isn't sort of really relevant to what we're talking about at the moment. So we'll come to that at the end. Um, so with, you know, looking at, at the microbiome and, as well, and, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about treatment, um, but, but how about its, its potential for diagnosis of cancers? Is, is there research going on in that area as well? Yeah, there's quite a lot of research going on because um, one thing that we see about the microbiome is that, you know, we can easily change it with food or with, um, you know, different kind of interventions, probiotics, prebiotics. Um, so, and also we can measure it quite cheaply and easily using stool samples. So there was qu there's quite a lot of interest from um, companies trying to develop tests that will improve screening for, for colorectal cancer and, you know, um, early diagnosis. Um, there have been some studies that have um, shown that if you do your fecal immune um, chemical test, which is your, your screening test, and you add um, a test that looks for particular bacteria that you can actually improve the detection of um, tumors and also adenomas. Um, so I think there's a lot of studies, Not I'm not doing um, those kind of studies myself, but um, in other centers looking at developing tests and improving our current screening um, for colorectal cancer. Mm, yeah. And in relation to other gut cancers, yeah, are you aware yeah. of any research um, around that? Because I think you know, if we look at the gut cancers as a whole, you know, yeah. currently there is a bowel screening program in place, but for the other gut cancers there, you know, the upper GI cancers yeah, in really particular, not, really yeah. difficult to yeah. Um, diagnose. Um, yeah, so there's some, um, a really good study came out in um, looking at pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma just recently, a couple of months ago, actually. Um, and what these, um, this group of researchers found was that um, there was a very specific fecal microbiome signature that was very specific to um, pancreatic cancer. And they were able to detect um, can uh, pancreatic cancer even at an early stage just using this um, microbiome signature. So, I mean, it was a relatively small number of patients. I think it was between two and 300 patients. But, you know, the, it definitely does give, give some hope, really, and suggests that maybe a fecal microbiome test um, would be the basis for a screening test for, for pancreatic, for some pancreatic um, cancers. So that's yeah. actually, you know, probably one of the most exciting things I think that's come out in this area in the last, the last wee while. Mm. No, that is exciting. And, um, you know, as we know, you know, currently the diagnostic tools are quite costly in that, you know, it scans, etc. you know, um, having something as simple as, as a fecal test like we do yes, for bowel yeah. cancer, will be game changing. So yeah, we'll... yeah. So you know, watch the space. I mean, these things they do take time to develop, you know, they'll have to go into clinical trial, as you know, and go through the different phases. But, you know, hopefully uh, that will develop into something that's actually going to be usable as a screening tool. Yeah. Now, our oh, treatment that's... options for, for pancreatic cancer are, are pretty limited as well. So you know, yeah. it's really important to develop the, the screening tools that can detect them earlier. Hmm. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. 
Um, I think we've sort of covered off some of the questions I had. I'll just see what questions we have from the audience. If there's anything else you wanted to, to bring up, Rachel, and in relation um, to this. I suppose one of the, the kind of the key um, you know, research areas of the last couple of years has been um, in immunotherapy and, and okay, they're not really used very widely in uh, GI cancers yet, but there have been some amazing advances in um, how we um, harness the microbiome to improve immunotherapy response. Um, and that's kind of come from animal models, but now is actually in cl clinical trials. We've had some um, results from early phase clinical trials that have shown quite dramatic improvements, you know, in response to immunotherapy when um, patients are given a fetal transplant from a patient who's already done well. And that actually oh. changes, yeah, changes the microbiome, the gut microbiome, and then that has a systemic effect and allows a patient then to have a, a good response to immunotherapy. So, you know, that's been a massive change, I think, in, in the thought processes of, you know, how we'd actually treat cancers in the future. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of research being done in that area. But also looking at, you know, how the microbiome interacts with chemotherapy as well, and also with radiotherapy. So, you know, they're probably a little bit further behind, but there's definitely quite a lot of work being done. Um, mm. both in improving response to, to chemotherapy and radiotherapy, but also you know, how we might use things like a fecal micro, microbiome transplant to um, alleviate some of the symptoms that you get as, as side effects from cancer treatments. Well, that's fascinating. I know, it, is, it really is. Yeah, yeah. Like and as you say, you know. 20 years ago or 10 years ago, you never thought, you know, you might get a poo transplant and that might actually, you know, help how you respond to therapy. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. As you say, you know, quite a relatively new science or, or yeah. understanding of, of the microbiome. And, and I guess as time goes on, more and more will be discovered yeah. um, through research. So, you know, that's fascinating. Um, I'm just having a look, we've got a couple more questions here. Um, you know, we had, um, Question here, uh, just wondering if there are any of your results published yet, be great to read them. I guess that's in relation to your, to your study that you've done with um, colorectal cancer. Yep, yeah, we do, we do a couple, of, a couple of papers and I can, I don't know, maybe if you contact Sue or contact. Yep, so contact, I've got. I can, um, I can link, yeah. link in with those, yep. Yeah, Victoria, who's asked the question, we can um, email that through um, if you're interested in those papers. Maybe put a reference up on our website as well. And then we've got a question here from Steve. Can you expand on why immunotherapy does not work well with GI cancers, with gut cancers? Is it also due to lack of testing? Um, question. Well, I think initially when immunotherapy was developed, everybody got really excited and went, you know, this is it, it's going to, you know, going to be the next thing and it's going to sort out our, our issues with a lot of solid tumours. And um, and then, you know, trials in, I think most of them were done in colorectal cancers, or a lot of them were, and really not that many people had any response at all. Um, and what we, well, immunotherapy uses the, the body's own immune system to attack the tumours but you have to have a certain certain immune cells within the tumor and they have to be switched on in a particular way. And this just doesn't seem to be the case in most colorectal cancers. Um, and that's kind of what we're trying to, trying to do is, is, is to see if we can um, actually kind of modulate that a bit. But um, yeah, yeah and, and unfortunately then, because you know that was kind of seen early on, then a lot of um, colorectal cancers just aren't included in trials now. So we're not actually kind of making a huge amount of progress in that area because, you know, with the trials, they, they want to have good outcome. You know, if they're being sponsored, particularly if they're sponsored by drug companies, they, they want obviously to see great improvements in survival and outcome. And if they already know that particular tumors aren't going to, it's going to respond, they're not going to include them. Hmm. Okay, no, that's interesting. Hope that answers your question, Steve. Um, and I've got a question here from Karen, uh, just on another topic. There's recent discussion about glyphosate residue in food being harmful to the human microbiome. Uh, what does the evidence tell us on, about this topic? 
Oh. <laughs> um, I actually haven't read much about um, the effect on the microbiome. I was working in the with WHO when they did put out that report that um, basically said that it, it's a, a carcinogen. Um, so yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of controversy around that, but you know, I mean, I think that the evidence is actually quite strong that it is carcinogenic. Um, whether that works through the microbiome or not, I, I don't know because I haven't actually um, been involved in that or been or kept myself updated <laughs> in that area. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I would say that yes, it, it is labelled as a carcinogen, even though mm. it's, that's disputed in some countries, including New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, but the international evidence would say yes, it is. Okay, great. I hope that answers your question, Karen. I think that's about all the questions uh, that we've got at the moment, unless anyone else has got any others, um, or if there's anything else you want to add, Rachel. Oh, I don't think so. I probably talked a bit fast, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all good. It was all, um, all fascinating um, information. Oh, and as a, yeah. Sorry, just just maybe want to say that, I guess we are, we're probably aware of a lot of the risk factors for GI cancers. And when we kind of look at what those you know, risk factors are on a population wide level, things like, um, you know, our diet and, and obesity and um, physical activity, smoking and alcohol intake, we also we get we're kind of starting to see that a lot of those things actually um, they kind of they work through the microbiome. So it's 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 no big surprise, really, that you know, changes in the microbiome are also affected by all of those factors. So, um, you know, I guess how I think of it is like, you've got the microbiome is like the meat and the sandwich between kind of what happens outside and what happens inside your body. Um, and I think if maybe if you kind of start thinking about it like that and actually considering your microbiome, maybe we all treat it a little bit better because it, it does a really important job for us. Um. Now, there's one question that came up, I believe, uh, at an earlier webinar around um, getting tested, having your microbiome tested. Are you, are you aware of any, um, any place yeah. that you can go and say, well, you've got good gut microbiome or not? Well, to be honest, at this stage, because as we, we talked about, um, we don't know, there's no one healthy microbiome. You know, I mean, depending on where you live and your genetic background and what you eat, we could be equally healthy, but have a different microbiome. So at the moment, getting it tested is, I would say, a waste of money because there's, there, there are no um, like commercially available tests that can actually tell you anything relevant, I think. And there's nothing that can be clinically translated at the moment. Um, that's not to say there aren't companies out there that will do it for a fee. But I think what you get back, you, you'll, you might just find out what's there. But I mean, being able to actually you know take anything meaningful from that at the moment um we're not quite there yet mm. no that's really interesting because i do get asked that question a couple of times whenever we're talking about microbiome yeah. well where can i go and get tested and uh yeah so it's good to know that we're not quite there yet quite there. um yeah now just one other question that's come through um Oh, this is a follow-up on, on our discussion of probiotics. Um, along the pro probiotic questions, where is yogurt seen um, after antibiotic uses, usage? Is it beneficial or not? Um, I, the evidence is kind of coming down qu quite positively on the side of anything that's fermented. So fermented foods, including yogurt, um, appear to be uh, supportive of a, what we call it, you know, a good microbiome with lots of those bacteria that that um, break down uh, starches and, and uh, fibers. So yeah, I, I would say anything that's kind of a, a natural food that's that's fermented is seems to be some good evidence there that that's um, beneficial. Right. Okay. And I've got another question just come in. Um, can improved microbiome assist in treatment in metastatic liver cancer? Um, I don't think there's actually any um, any data on that at the moment. Yeah, there's, there's probably a lot less done in liver cancers um, than in other other GI cancers. 
Right. Okay. Yes. So sorry, we, we can't sorry. offer anything <laughs> up on that one. Um, and I think I think that's oh wait a minute, we've got another question coming. Um, okay, uh, here's one. Um, I've had diarrhea for 10 years. I've had bloating. I've been treated with loperamide. I have a colonoscopy every five years. I'm not sure if that's a question. Is there, is there anything else to come on that? No, and then another, oh, sorry, just to follow up um, regarding the immunotherapy question. My previous question should have been worded better, i.e., can microbiome influence the immune checkpoints to either respond or prevent the breakdown overexpression in the first instance? I think that's in relation to um, immunotherapy. Yeah, the immunotherapy. Yeah, and I think that's really where those um, studies that have been recently published in melanoma and lung cancer, um, you know, basically the outcome of those is that yes, the microbiome does seem to, um, you know, have a very strong influence on how people respond to immune checkpoint therapy. Um, there, but I'll say that even though these, you know, we're in clinical trial phase two in some of these studies, um, they haven't actually uh, identified what the mechanism is yet. So there's still a lot of work to be done kind of in, in functional biology in the labs that's you know, kind of maybe lagging behind what's actually happening in the clinics when it comes to immunotherapy. Yeah, okay. Um, just to follow up on the fermented foods, uh, they're questioning kombucha, sauerkraut, help microbiome biome in terms of fermented food, I would say, uh, Judging by your previous answer, yeah. <laughs> that would be a do. yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. Oh, we've got them coming in. Yeah, and just a thank you uh, on the answer regarding the immune immunotherapy. Um, you know, okay, well, I think that's, that's about it. And um, yeah, so... You know, thank you once again, Rachel, uh, for sharing your knowledge with us. It's it's a developing field, and maybe in a year or two we'll get you back and 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 look at how things have moved on. Um, it's a fascinating field of research, and um, it's great to to hear the progress of of the research that uh, Gut Cancer Foundation supporters uh, funded. Um, for anyone watching the webinar, as I say, we have recorded it. We will share the recording. And if you'd like to find out more about our work and, and research that's being funded currently, you can check that out on our website, gutcancer.org.nz. But thank you once again, Rachel. Really appreciate your time and sharing your knowledge with us. And um, we will end the webinar there. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you.